Kibot, your cat's best friend. The Kibot is a Raspberry Pi that's been wired into an automatic pet food dispenser. The Pi gives you control of the feeder's motor, so you can decide when you want to give kibble. The Python code gives you a simple web interface that has a button that gives food when you click it. Setting up your feeder this way gives you a whole lot more control over it. Makes it easy to connect it to the internet, and you won't have to use the app that comes from the manufacturer. You can also do a whole lot more complicated things with it. For example, you can connect the feeder to a VPN and your home surveillance system so that you can keep an eye on your cats when you're away from home, and when they look hungry, you can give them some food. And let me tell you, the feeder might be very popular. So if you like cats and you're looking for a nice and easy hardware hacking project, give the Kibbot a try. How difficult is this project? I think it's a pretty forgiving project, but you'll need to push yourself a bit if you're new to electronics. What makes this project easy is that an automatic feeder is really a simple machine. It's just a motor in a plastic housing. And luckily motors are something very well supported in hobbyist electronics. You can order all the parts online. But what makes this hard is that it'll cost you about $100 in parts, some of which you'll have to destroy to improve. That can be hard to do. And if you make a mistake, you can break things permanently. That feels wasteful. Also, if your automatic feeder is different from mine, you'll have to figure it out yourself, and that can be tricky. So there's a few things you might find difficult. You can make this all easier by having the right tools. I found that having a DuPont connector crimper meant that I didn't have to do any soldering. And not having to do any soldering is great because it's not for everyone, and besides, the equipment is at least $100. A crimper and a DuPont connector kit is only about $50. So, I think making the kebab is a good beginner hardware hacking project. Deep Dive. How the automatic feeder works. My automatic feeder is a motor that spins a drum that takes in kibble and dispenses it in portions. The drum has three rounded corners that press a switch, which is how the machine knows the position of the drum. One full spin of the drum gives out three portions. The feeder has a screen and some buttons for either automatically feeding portions on a schedule or for doing manual feedings. The screen locks after a short period. I'm guessing that's to make it harder for an animal to operate a machine with their noses. And they will try, I've seen it. Nope. No free lunch. The feeder has a small coin cell battery to keep the time when powered off. It's also possible to power the machine with 3D batteries as a battery backup. I never bothered because I'd have to regulate the batteries to 5 volts, but it's something you could definitely do with the right parts. The feeder's fed by a small 5 volt 1 amp charger. The drum motor also runs at 5 volts. The switch is 3 volts, so the logic is probably 3.3 volts. This is worth remembering when playing around with the circuitry. Taking it apart. Most pieces of the feeder came apart easily. Separating the motor's drum structure was a challenge. First I thought it was held by plastic clips, but no matter how hard I tried, I could not pry it loose. I then wondered if the thing things were held by screws after all. It turned out they were hidden underneath the feeder's rubber pad or feet. By ripping these off, I could remove the four screws and the feeder came apart. So be patient and check around before you your teardown turns into a literal tearing apart of plastic. Inside, wires are soldered to terminals, and there is what looks like a JST header. I'm not sure how it glued to the main board. There is a white wire heading from the three D batteries to the board. There are a pair of wires each going to the motor and to the lever switch. The motor's rotating structure has corners that press on the switch three times during each complete spin. So to take this apart, I just cut all the wires at about midpoint. This left me with a disconnected main board, red voltage and black ground wires, yellow positive and gray negative wires for the motor, black ground for the switch's input, and a blue wire for the returning signal. I finished all the cut wires ends with DuPont connectors. This way I can easily rewire the feeder back to its original state. It didn't really matter whether there were male or female connectors, I've got plenty of the other kind to connect everything together.
Tools and Hardware I used a Raspberry Pi 02W, the cheapest in-stock board I could find. A Pico W would also work, but it's just so much easier and fun to use a full Linux machine. Note, the Raspberry Pi Zero product line doesn't have a protective fuse, so make sure to give it 5 volts only. I fried a Pi Zero by plugging it into a fast charging phone charger, the kind that can go to 12 volts. I'm not sure why the fast charge mode activated, so I've stuck to regular 5 volt chargers ever since. I used the Pi motor controller hat to control the motor from the Pi. The hat is just a motor control chip that connects to some of the Pi's pins. Any other motor controller should work. Only one channel is needed because a single motor over only ever goes forward. The ability to supply a separate 5 volt voltage is necessary since the motor runs at 5 volts and not the 3.3 volts of the Pi's GPIO. In our case, the feeder already has 5 volts, so we just use that. Note to only power a motor from the Pi's 5 volt pins. These are the raw power source. Powering it from different pins will probably cook your Pi. La pièce de résistance is my DuPont connector kit and crimper. This thing has made everything very easy. With the kit, I could just cut the feeder's wire, put DuPont connectors on the ends, and plug them wherever I wanted. I use both male and female connectors. Male connectors will plug in breadboards and screw terminals, and female sockets are needed for the Pi's GPIO pins. It's a good idea to have an assortment of pre-made DuPont connectors too, and all the colors of the rainbow so you can tell what's what. A hot glue gun and a Raspberry Pi spacer kits are helpful for securing components in place. And it's a really good idea to have a multimeter so that you can check your feeder circuitry. This is my first hardware hack and it's a pretty basic one. Nevertheless, I think it's a good idea to check and write yourself some notes too. Another helpful thing to have is a camera so that you can take photos of the feeder's teardown in case you forget how to put it all back together. It's also really good to have a record of what the dispenser looked like when it was operating in case you destroy it. For example, it's easy to have the motor running in the wrong direction. Keeping a video will help prevent that. Putting together the new board. Putting together the new Raspberry Pi setup is not hard if you have the parts. We just need to control the motor and read the switch to determine the motor's position. Before that, we need to power things. The power supply can be connected to the Pi's 5 volt and ground pins. On the Pi Zero, these pins are connected to the Pi's power rails, so they're okay to use this way. If this is into your liking, I see two alternatives. One, run a 5 volt power supply with the right connector for your Pi through a hole you drill in the back of the feeder. Two, wire your own USB power connector to the voltage and ground in the feeder. You can find USB breakout boards for micro B USB older unit uh, models of Pi use that, and the USB-C, which is uh, for the Pi 4 and the Pi 5. The motor can be connected to a motor Pi hat. Put the hat on the Pi, secure the motor's wires into the screw terminals, and feed 5 volts into the controller's own power. The switch in the feeder drives its output to ground when pressed, so you'll need to drive your Pi's digital input pin high to 3.3 volts with a pull-up resistor. I use 4.7 kilo ohms. What this all means is that when the switch is not pressed, your Pi will read on or high at 3.3 volts. When the switch is pressed, the connection to ground will drive your input pin to off or low along with it. This is thanks to the pull-up resistor that will weaken the 3.3 volts so that the ground signal can easily overwhelm it. There's an extra wrinkle though. The switch will be noisy, meaning that it'll bounce around high and low as it switches, or just when it feels like it. This means it'll be hard to detect what the switch is really doing. The noise can be reduced with a 0.1 microfarad ceramic capacitor across the input pin and the ground. So one leg of the capacitor on the digital pin, the other leg on the ground. The capacitor will even out the power fluctuations. Still, it's worth making your Python code wait a few cycles to make sure a change between high and low is genuine, which I'll show later on. Software strategy. To control the kibot, I use a very simple flash server. This puts the kibot on the LAN, and if you have a VPN configured, it also opens it up to a distant remote control. 
Flask is a simple web server. When a visitor requests a URL, the server runs the appropriate Python code. The user selects uh, a URL or a path that doesn't exist, the server returns an error. So Flask creates a website with some Python code living inside, and you can make it do all sorts of things. The kibot simply needs to have a page with the link to dispense food. When the visitor clicks the link, the bot dispenses a portion. On the server, Python accesses the Raspberry Pi's GPIO pins. These pins are connected to the motor on the switch, so Python can drive the motor and stop it when it needs to. Controlling the motor is not difficult, thanks to the MotorPy hat. The board's GitHub repo has an example. You can easily adapt and use. The RPy GPIO library already has all it needs, and no extra libraries are necessary. So once the pins are assigned, the code can set the motor speed, and when it's time to stop, the uh, stop method there is called. Reading the switch isn't difficult, but actually making use of the signal requires a bit of work. First, we're interested in the falling edge of the switch's signal, meaning that we want to know when the switch goes from high, which is unpressed, to low, pressed. Remember that the switch is connected to ground so that it drives the signal low when it's pressed. We need a while loop that compares the current signal against the one from the previous loop. So second, the signal is noisy despite the capacitor. It'll bounce around between high and low as the switch is pressed. And while it might be possible to clean up the signal more, there's a cheap solution actually. The code can wait to see if the signal stays low for a thousand cycles after it detects the falling edge. This creates a tiny delay before the motor stops, but it's a fairly reliable way of detecting when the switch is actually pressed. So with these two things together, the motor control and the switch logic, the web server can dispense portions of food when the link is clicked. There are two other things to do though, include a log and protect against accidental feedings. Log is easily made by saving the time of each request to a comma separated values file, or CSV. This kind of file is very simple and can be written to without much trouble. When the web page is displayed, the file is read, parsed, and sorted to give a history log. This way you have some idea of how often you're feeding your cats. You can protect against accidental feedings a few ways. You can make the links expire after a short amount of time. In our case, we can just put a timestamp at the end of each link and check that the timestamp is recent enough when the request is received. If the request uses a timestamp that's too old, the request fails. The datetime standard library makes this easy with its time deltas, particularly their ability to divide each other. By subtracting the timestamp from the current time, we get a delta we can divide by time delta minutes equal one to get the difference in minutes. If the result is greater than one, return an error and give no kibs. But if it's good, give some kibs. Final thoughts. The Pi can do a whole lot of other things. You could add a camera, a speaker, or maybe a water fountain to your automatic feeder. With some wheels, it could have extra mobility to run away from your cats, you know, a bit of exercise. So there's plenty of other things you can do. So if you have any questions or comments, feel free to reach out to me. Hope you enjoyed this.